Hi, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Peter Knox. Uh, I want to welcome you to another event in the Baker Nord Center's calendar for the third annual Cleveland Humanities Festival on the theme of health. The Cleveland Humanities Festival is a collaborative event coordinated by us here at Case Western Reserve University. Every spring now, we celebrate the great educational and cultural institutions of our city in Northeast Ohio. They provide a platform to explore from the perspective of the humanities subjects that matter to us as a society and a nation. This year, we have more than 30 partner institutions offering programs on the theme of health. For a couple of weeks already now, we've been attending lectures, symposia, film screenings, exhibits, and more here on the campus and around the city at our partner institutions. It's a pleasure to see you here tonight and I hope that you will take the opportunity to attend many other events in the festival, most of which are free and open to the public. And I also want to acknowledge the support of the citizens of Cuyahoga County uh, who are supporting this event through Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We've defined the theme of health very broadly to address the important subject of health care from a variety of perspectives. In our colleges and universities, we are considering the role of healthcare throughout history and its representation in literature and the arts. In theaters, we are reviewing films that provoke important conversations about how we confront healthcare crises in our country and around the world. In our museums, we have been considering how aspiring physicians can learn to interpret what they see by looking at works of art. And we have learned about how patients can find comfort and healing in art and literature. One of the emerging themes throughout the events taking place around our city is the increasing importance of the field that we now call medical humanities, among many other terms. Students in Case Western Reserve University's School of Medicine can now compete for admission to a pathway in the humanities, directed by my colleague, Dr. Susan Stagno. Students at the Learner School of Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic can participate in their program in medical humanities, which is run by Dr. Martin Cohn, who earlier today read from his own poetry as part of our festival. And students can now pursue an MA degree in medicine, society, and culture in our Department of Bioethics under the guidance of Professors Eileen Anderson Fye and Jonathan Sadowski. We are particularly pleased to be welcoming one of the foundational figures in the field of medical humanities today, Arthur Frank. Dr. Frank is a professor emeritus of, so of sociology at the University of Calgary, a professor at the specialized university in Bergen and Oslo, Norway, and a core faculty member at the Center for Narrative Practice in Boston. He's also held visiting appointments at a host of other institutions in Sydney, Tokyo, Toronto, and elsewhere. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and of the Hastings Center for Bioethics. In 2008, he was awarded the Royal Society of Canada's Abbeyanne Lynch Medal for Bioethics. And in 2016, he received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Canadian Bioethics Society. Arthur Frank is the author of several books that are central to the practice of medical humanities and narrative medicine, including the influential illness narrative at the will of the body, first published in 1991. The Wounded Storyteller, published in 1995, has become a classic in the study of narrative in medicine, a point of reference for those involved in medical education as well as clinicians, caregivers, and patients. His most recent book, Letting Stories Breathe, is at the core not only of the field of medical humanities, but the humanities writ large. Stories are how we process our experiences as individuals and make sense of those experiences as a community. Stories are what we tell, and what we learn how to interpret in the practice of the humanities. Dr. Frank has been influential in imparting to the medical profession the critical importance of recognizing the place of stories in the experience of care. This afternoon, he will tell us about how a story can be a companion during times of suffering, speaking to us on the therapeutic process using narrative, a vulnerable reading of Shakespeare's The Tempest. Please welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Arthur Frank. Oh, I was going to start by thanking people, but then as people were coming in, I realized I'm going to have to thank about half the room because I've been here for several days now and had such a good time doing so many different things with a number of you who are here. So I will just most immediately thank Maggie, who's sitting in the back. 
<laughs> and Maggie does an absolutely incredible job of arranging trips like mine. And it makes a huge difference having a good organizer. You're lucky to have Maggie. Thank you. Shakespeare's last single authored play, The Tempest, begins with a shipwreck. That in itself should attract the interest of colleagues who are seeking readings appropriate to the health humanities. In my years of reading first person memoirs of illness, the metaphor of shipwreck is one that occurs most frequently. My own 1991 memoir of illness, At the Will of the Body, concludes with one of Western culture's most famous shipwreck victims, Jonah, who fell off his ship into the mouth of a whale. My 1995 study of illness narratives, The Wounded Storyteller, begins with a letter I received from a woman who evoked her life with illness by writing the destination and map I had used to navigate before were no longer useful. That isn't quite crashing onto the rocks, but it definitely falls into the family of shipwreck metaphors. The work I have done for three decades is about how people live lives during and after shipwreck. For some of these people, the wreckage seems pretty much over. Others reflect during a period of relative calm, but await the full force of the storm. During these three decades, both I and the condition of illness have undergone some change. How I have changed is nicely described by one of the last century's greatest literary critics, Northrop Fry. I will be calling on Fry later as our principal guide when we get to the Tempest. But for now, let me quote one of his more general observations. Fry proposed that literary critics come in two types, Iliad critics and Odyssey critics. Iliad critics are interested in tragedy. They favor realism, and they like irony. Odyssey critics are drawn to comedy and the genre of romance. When I wrote At the Will of the Body and the Wounded Storyteller, I was on the Iliad side of that divide. I wanted stories that were realistic, especially in not shying away from the confusion, the sheer mess, and the everyday tragedies of illness. Bearing witness to those stories was my commitment and struggle, which was often a little literal editorial struggle, getting the darker side of illness into print in my work and the work of others. Today, at my present age, I find myself wanting to be more on the Odyssey side. But please recognize that for Fry, the genres of comedy and romance deal with some of life's most serious issues. Homer's Odyssey is a trail of dead bodies. In Shakespeare's romances, people who are faultless still get killed. These deaths are sad, but they are somehow not tragic events. Evil intrudes, but it is provisional, and at the end, the possibility of good dominates the future. The implication for my work of moving toward the Odyssey side is succinctly stated in a quotation that is far older than either Shakespeare or Homer. In the Chinese book known as the I Ching, as recently translated by David Hinton, one of the more apparently straightforward aphorisms is, to navigate danger, use delight. Navigating danger takes us back to shipwrecks, but the advice to use delight is definitely on Fry's odyssey side of attitudes toward life. Delight 
is not a necessary word. My friend David Morris seems to mean something similar with his use of the word eros in his recent book, Eros and Medicine. In my earlier book, The Renewal of Generosity, I ended with a call for medicine to take seriously the need to bring joy back into its practices. Each of these words, delight, eros, and joy, mean something different, but they point in a similar direction. My late life Odyssean turn has taken me into the field known generically as literature and medicine, but with a difference that reflects my earlier commitments to bringing the voice and perspective of the ill into the discourses of healthcare. Without doing a content analysis of the articles that have appeared in the journal entitled Literature and Medicine, which has been published for some years now by Johns Hopkins, I believe it's fair to say that most of these articles use literary texts as a basis for reflection on medicine in the restrictive sense of physicians' activities and diseases as these are understood within a medical paradigm. When ill people occur in these studies, and they do not infrequently, they are still the objects of medical attention. And if they're quoted, their words are quoted in terms of their relevance for physicians. My own interest is less in literary works about illness. Instead, I'm interested in literature for ill people. My interest is how people who are currently living with illness can find better ways to live if they do so in companionship with literature. My name for this way of finding life with illness more interesting in companionship with literature is vulnerable reading. I want to say a bit more about vulnerable reading and then I want to illustrate it, or if I do a good job, enact such a reading by talking about The Tempest. A couple of years ago, I got the idea that it would be interesting to set up reading groups, although at the time I thought of these as support groups. Subsequently, I and my fellow participants dropped that usage as we actually engaged in these groups. The project was to perform together a reader's theater of one of Shakespeare's plays over a series of meetings, and along the way, talk about how the play reflected concerns either of being ill or of providing health care. Mostly because I had little idea how this was going to go and wanted to do a minimum amount of damage to the initial participants, we started off with just healthcare workers in the groups. The project uh, being in a very happy collaboration with the Alberta Pastoral Care Association. We've now done four groups, and I'm still on too much of a learning curve to want to take the project to ill people, although I hope someday to do that. The first play we read together was Hamlet, and so I called the project Hamlet in the Hospital, mostly just because I like the alliteration. <laughs> but we've never met in a hospital, and we only did Hamlet that first time. I don't write about the specifics of what takes place in the Hamlet in the Hospital groups, and I don't plan to. I like keeping the groups as separate as possible from my writing to prevent me from thinking of our meetings as occasions for me to gather material to give lectures like this one. In the groups where people who like to read Shakespeare, who struggle to express issues, dilemmas, and troubles in the suffering of illness, and then in the provision of health care, and the boundaries between the suffering of illness and the provision of health care get pretty, pretty blurry 
people talk about their experiences of being ill and their experiences of being professionals caring for the ill. Like most such groups, we start as strangers and we develop a very particular closeness. Separate as I want the groups to remain from my writing, it's in the groups that I learn what to write. For me, the groups are a necessary reality check on the project of vulnerable reading. What I'm hoping to write, what my lecture today is the beginning of writing, is something that may ultimately be useful either for facilitators of such groups or for people participating in such groups or for people who can't get to such groups but want to undertake a similar work on their own. To them, I hope my eventual book might be useful as a companion. What matters to me is less to present vulnerable reading as a program and more to exemplify or enact it through engagements with particular texts, which today happens to be The Tempest. That said, a few orienting comments might be useful. Vulnerable reading is for people whose lives are somehow self-consciously in trouble. With illness being my paradigm of life's troubles, but those troubles extending outwards from illness. Such a reading has at least four aspects. First and foremost, the literary work is taken into a person's life as a source of solace. That's the best word I could come up with, solace. Such a reading is neither bibliotherapy, as that's emerging, nor is it narrative therapy. But it is about opening oneself to the literary work as having a potentially therapeutic effect on one's life. The beginning of that effect is delight, the word I used earlier, to navigate danger, use delight. Delight includes the engagement in story that comes in story that comes from feeling suspense while imagining realities that are not exactly real, but possibly should be possible. Delight comes from the literary work's crucial capacity to see the world as often a sad place, sometimes a bitter place, but in the end, a place that can be filled with wonder. Solace depends on wonder. Second, finding solace in a literary work involves doing what many literary critics seem to disdain, which is reading to insert oneself into the plot through identification with characters. It's not coincidental that I imagine vulnerable reading in an age that has invented and proliferated fan fiction. That is, readers who self-publish on the internet, picking up a story where a published author leaves off and imagining new possibilities for the characters, possibly including themselves as a character. As an example, and it's actually a two-layered example if you think about it, Margaret Atwood's recent novel, Hagseed, retells the story of The Tempest. It's in the wonderful series that the Hogarth Press is doing on contemporary retellings of Shakespeare stories. Margaret Atwood's Prospero is an otherwise out-of-work theater director who's gotten a job putting on a production of The Tempest in a prison. He leads an exercise in which the cast members, all prisoners, imagine the lives of the play's characters after the play ends. What each imagines says a good deal about the person doing the imagining. That's fan fiction. Vulnerable reading finds solace in playing such storytelling games as ways to be delighted with a story that is not the text of contemporary literary analyses, but rather is an open-ended possibility for creative exploration. Third, and briefly, 
vulnerable reading seeks to make life more interesting by using the characters we find in the reading as types that the reader can play with by literally characterizing the people whom she encounters according to how they fit these types. This will be my main emphasis today, turning to The Tempest in a moment. Fourth and in summary, my interest here can be called moral, tying into my work in narrative bioethics. As we read literature, one question to ask is, how well is this character playing his or her part? Is she or he rising to the occasion, or is this character dragging down others? Stories, as I and many other colleagues have observed, are a principal venue in which we humans explore how to live a good life. Moral life becomes in stories. Stories do not prescribe goodness in principle, but literature puts us in the here and now of people struggling to live right, often uncertain of what that actually means. That's what we see on any theatrical stage, especially on Shakespeare's stage. People making terrible mistakes, but ultimately trying to do something good as they live lives enmeshed with other people and threatened by events. We in the audience are not just spectating as these people muddle through their lives. We actively identify with their muddling, and thus we find solace in our own muddling. So reading The Tempest. Northrop Frye, our critic as guide today, writes with seriously intended wit that in Shakespeare's earlier play, Measure for Measure, every character on stage is insane. I place Measure for Measure midway between Shakespeare's comedies and his later romances, or in my earlier metaphor, borrowed from Fry, midway between an Iliad view of life and an Odyssey view. A few years later, when Shakespeare writes The Tempest, he imagines characters who are not insane, but who all have a great deal to learn. And some have sins that need both acknowledgement and forgiveness. As we watch the redemption of these characters, or in readers' theater, as we play at being these characters and have an experience of their redemption, we realign ourselves in our own worlds. Vulnerable reading aims at such realignment as its principal therapeutic effect. One reason I choose Shakespeare for this project is that his plays are tales in the folkloric sense. The plots have a quality of being already familiar as if we've heard the story before, but have to be reminded of certain details that we've forgotten along the way. That explains the paradox of a Shakespeare production that however obscure the language gets, and it frequently gets really obscure, it's clear enough to just about everybody who's done what, who's doing what, and what still needs to get done. Fry is worth quoting on this point. Shakespeare's later plays, he writes, get closer all the time to folk tales and myths because these are primitive stories. They don't depend on logic, they don't explain things, and they don't give you time to react. That quotation says more about vulnerable reading than I have time to unpack. I will try to show some of the implications of what Fry is suggesting. If you haven't seen The Tempest recently, <laughs> it's easily summarized, though endlessly rethinkable. As I said, the play begins with a shipwreck. First, we're on deck as the ship is going down. Then the wreck is being described by Ariel, a fairy spirit whose powers 
are especially to create illusions. Ariel is gender neutral and has been played by both men and women. Ariel is reporting to his or her master, Prospero, who has ordered the storm that caused the shipwreck, but it's all been an illusion. The sailors are safely in harbor, asleep. Three groups of passengers have washed ashore, separated from each other, and the plot will follow how Prospero, working through Ariel, directs their wanderings until the climactic scene in which all converge. The ship that apparently wrecked carries Alonzo, the king of Naples, who is sailing home after the wedding of his daughter. Those attending the king include his advisor, Gonzalo, and his brother, Sebastian. There's also Antonio, the Duke of Milan, who is Prospero's brother. So it's a gang of four. These four will wander about together. Also on board is Alonzo, the king's son, Ferdinand, who washes up alone. Ferdinand will soon meet Miranda, Prospero's daughter, and by Prospero's intended design, they will fall in love. The third group are two servants, Trinculo and Stefano, who are the play's clowns. They soon encounter Caliban, whom they many consider to be the most interesting character and certainly the most controversial character in the play. I will get back to Caliban presently. After the shipwreck scene, there's a longish exposition of Prospero telling Miranda the story of how the two of them came to the island when Miranda was a small child. Prospero was Duke of Milan, but not very good at it. He preferred being absorbed in his books and turned over the affairs of state to his brother, Antonio. Antonio not unreasonably decides he would rather be Duke himself. He is, after all, doing the work and better than his brother did it. He then deposes Prospero, but he fears to kill him. He sets Prospero and Miranda adrift in a leaky boat, which Gonzalo, the counselor, has conveniently provisioned, including in the provisions Prospero's most essential books. The boat comes ashore on the island, which is magical. Fortunately, Prospero's books have taught him the magic necessary to control the island, and in particular to free Ariel, his spirit servant. And here we come to the image, Arthur Rackham's painting of Ariel imprisoned. Ariel has been, Im been imprisoned for 12 years in a cloven pine by the witch Sycorax, whose evil bidding Ariel refused to do. So as you listen to me use this word vulnerability without ever taking the time to explain it, just look at the image. This is vulnerability. It's a beautiful image. It's why it's my favorite Tempest image. Sycorax, who put Ariel in the tree, died before Prospero arrived on the island, leaving behind her son, Caliban, who is variously described and in different stage productions variously costumed as more or less human. Fry points out that different characters in the play see Caliban as more human or more monstrous, just as they perceive and experience the island differently. These differences say something about whoever is doing the, the perceiving. If Ariel, once he or she gets out of the pine tree, is Prospero's servant of the air, creating illusions that further Prospero's plan, Caliban is his servant of the earth, who carries logs and catches fish. Caliban claims rightful lordship over the island as his inheritance from his mother. In Caliban's version of events, Prospero has deposed him 
after he taught Prospero the secrets of the island. Prospero's version is that he treated Caliban kindly until Caliban attempted to rape Miranda, which Caliban readily acknowledges and still hopes to accomplish. Thus, when the clown servants, Trinculo and Stefano, come upon Caliban, Caliban enlists them in a plot to overthrow Prospero. Ferdinand's wanderings, as I said, lead him to Miranda and to falling in love. Trinculo and Stefano wander with Caliban and plot against Prospero. And the third group, the king and his courtiers, the courtiers being the king and the two courtiers being what Ariel calls the three men of sin, Gonzalo accepted, wander the most aimlessly, each in his own psychological space. Alonzo is in a space of grief, mourning what he supposes to be the drowning of his son Ferdinand. Gonzalo finds the island beautiful and imagines founding a utopia there. Antonio and Sebastian plot f further usurpations now against Alonzo. All are being observed and variously manipulated by Prospero, whose control of the action is never in question. Fry points out that each of the three groups undertakes its own form of quest, each is subjected to some form of ordeal, and each experiences a vision. The quest, ordeal, vision enact what can be called moral education. Near the end, the good Gonzalo says that during the events that have just transpired, all of them have found themselves when, e when no man was his own. Even Prospero has come to a new self-realization, most explicitly when he recognizes for the first time the part that he is responsible for in making Caliban what he is. One of the most famous lines in the play is Prospero saying, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine. Though Prospero, though how Prospero will act, and indeed what he actually means by this acknowledgement are outside the frame of the play, and thus more stuff for fan fiction. There can be many vulnerable readings of The Tempest. Let me suggest three that seem particularly available and fundamental. The first can be called reading for character identifications. The second is reading for tension between themes. And the third is reading for the mystery. So identifying with characters. In our reading group of The Tempest, we did a short reflective writing exercise focusing on our own attraction to one particular character. The, the assignment was just to free associate for a moment and think which character attracts you, and then write for a few minutes about what you think the basis of that attraction might be. Let me suggest the attractions of two characters, Prospero and Caliban. Fry discusses how each character embodies a character type that has traditions in folklore and more immediately in the Commedia dell'arte that Shakespeare, for I believe, had studied by this point. Prospero is the character type known as a pantalone. That is the older man who is characterized most by his obsession with keeping suitors away from his daughter. Um, Shylock in The Merchant of Venice starts off as a pantalone. Um, but Prospero's originality is that he only seems to oppose Ferdinand's pursuit of Miranda, while actually he encourages it. Caliban's character draws upon the Pincinello type, which is one of the clown characters. But like Prospero, he's more than just an enactment of that type alone. Fry enacts the depth and the pathos of Caliban's originality as a character when he writes that no character in Shakespeare retains more dignity under so constant a stream of abuse. 
Shakespeare depends upon the audience's immediate recognition of these character types. That again is how you know what's going on even if you can't say exactly what somebody just said. This in turn mirrors any person's negotiation of everyday life as that depends upon recognizing the people you meet as various types of characters. Any of us needs to be able to recognize when an individual's behavior accords with that type, but also to recognize when it goes beyond and departs from that type. Shakespeare's characters become most interesting as they act against the character type in which they're initially recognizable. Thus, Prospero and Caliban are much like all of us, part scripted by conventions that precede us and part unique and self-created. To engage these or any character in Shakespeare is to have to do the work of sorting out the typical aspect from the original aspect. And that, in turn, instigates reflection on our own lives and on perceptions of those around us. Reading Prospero instigates the fundamental questions that are asked in the hospital, in the care of any patient. Is anyone actually directing this show? as Prospero directs the show that takes place on the island. What powers does that person actually have at his or her disposal? And what are the limits of those powers? Who might be conspiring against that person? Conspiracies not unknown to hospital milieu. And more complex still, how does the Prospero figure balance two tensions. One tension is the ever-present risk of beneficence deteriorating into paternalism. In the beginning scenes of The Tempest, both Ariel and Miranda need to be reassured that Prospero's objectives are, in fact, benevolent, that no one will actually get hurt, and that all will actually learn something. But the danger of Prospero becoming an autocrat is always present throughout the play, especially in Prospero's treatment of the long-suffering Caliban. The second tension involves the subtle mutual relation between reality and illusion, one of the most difficult things for both healthcare workers and for patients. Prospero uses his magical art, which is fundamentally the art of creating utterly compelling illusions, to affect realities and to effect realities. Illusions are real in their consequences, to paraphrase an old sociological aphorism. Prospero's island, shaped as it is by his art and indistinguishable from his art, is perfectly described by Fry as a place presenting both an illusion of reality and the reality of illusion, which also describes Shakespeare's theater. The more I live in the world of the Tempest, the more I recollect my sense of hospitals as places balanced precariously between the illusion of reality and the reality of illusion. My point here, as elsewhere, is not to bring that rumination to some sort of conclusion, but to pose a different way of thinking about and perceiving something. The point is for each of us to go back to the hospital and try to see the place as a play of reality and illusion. Prospero guides us in that new way of perceiving Caliban is even more a character of contradictions. In post-colonialist retellings, most notably Aimé Cesare's play A Tempest, Caliban is a victimized hero, rightfully rebelling against Prospero, the colonizing tyrant. 
That's very high quality fan fiction. And it has widespread resonance for many vulnerable readers. My own preference, however, is to stay closer to what Shakespeare actually wrote, because Shakespeare forces us to hold on to two opposing aspects of Caliban and to imagine these coexisting in one person. First, Caliban is a self-acknowledged, if would-be, rapist. Shakespeare wants to keep that real, not an illusion. Second, Caliban speaks what may be the most poetic speech in one of Shakespeare's most poetical plays, the famous Be Not Afeard, The Island is Full of Noises, Sweet so Sounds in Sweet Airs That Give Delight and Hurt Not. Who then is Caliban? He is both a poet and also what Prospero calls a thing of darkness. His character poses the riddle of how far he has been turned into that thing of darkness by conditions imposed upon him, or is this his own nature? Caliban also instigates thinking about one of the most immediately bioethical dilemmas in The Tempest. Prospero causes Caliban to suffer. He causes him to be pinched and afflicted with cramps. He does this not for Caliban's moral education, but to control him and perpetuate his servitude. As I suggested, Prospero's claim to beneficence breaks down most conspicuously in his treatment of Caliban, in which Prospero acts quite nakedly for his own convenience. At the darkest level of this line of thinking, we have to ask how much Prospero needs a debased Caliban in order to fill his, fulfill his own imagination of himself. Fry puts the ethical problem directly. In what does superiority consist? A claim, a problem that is constant in hospital interactions. Prospero has significant claims to superiority, but his treatment of Caliban undercuts his claims even more than his earlier shortcomings in his responsibilities of ruling undercut them. Hospital patients can recognize a good deal of how they are treated as they take on the part into which Caliban is cast. Lower level healthcare workers might also share this identification. Second form of reading, reading for tensions between themes. I'll need to be brief here suggesting only one such tension. Note please that I find it useful to think not in terms of any single theme by itself, but rather, rather to think in terms of tensions between themes. Probably the most notable tension, and perhaps the most useful for vulnerable reading, is between imprisonment and release. Again, the reason for, oops, we lost our image. Well, you've all got it emblazoned in your consciousness. <laughs> Going back to Margaret Atwood's novel Hagseed, another exercise that the theater director gives his cast of prison inmates is to count the number of different prisons that occur in The Tempest. It's no spoiler to tell you that the correct answer is nine. The island is enchanting, but it also proliferates prisons. Imprisonment is always in tension with release. Ariel has been released from the imprisonment imposed by Sycorax, but remains in servitude to Prospero. In Ariel's first scene with Prospero, she, he seeks release. And when this release finally comes in the final act of the play, it's one of the most moving moments. Thinking about the various imprisonments in The Tempest enables thinking about issues that, if confronted directly in one's own life, are dangerous and possibly forbidden. For both healthcare workers and for patients, it's dangerous to let yourself think too much about ways in which hospitals imprison 
ways that treatment regimens imprison, and ways that professional, professional power readily imprisons both the professional and the patient. Both professionals and patients can and often do feel like prisoners. Each then seeks a different version of release. Vulnerable reading is not about realistic, descriptive elaboration of anyone's prison. It's not a political institutional critique. Nor does it offer any therapeutic or policy recommendations for releasing people. It is, to paraphrase Gonzalo, about each coming to know his or her own condition, where aspects of that condition were previously unknowable. Here is elsewhere a tale that delights, also enables reflection that can empower, especially by authorizing to say what had previously been unsayable. And third, reading for mystery. Shakespeare is writing plays to fill a theater, not treatises. As philosophically rich as Shakespeare's work is, it does its work by suggestion and by what is left unsaid. Prospero, like Hamlet, fascinates us because we can never know the true depth of his art. What he seems to know, but has not yet said. The dying Hamlet puts this issue explicitly. Had I but time, oh, I could tell you, but let it be. Prospero might well say the same thing. Fry writes, yet it is clear that the restructuring of the lives of the characters in the play is a deeply serious operation with an application in it for ourselves. We have not merely been watching a fairy tale, but participating in some kind of mystery. What kind of mystery? That question of what kind of mystery is, I think, not a question to be answered, but to be lived with. It's lived with by wondering about its application to our own lives. Living with that question does more than bring a bit of enchantment into mundane lives. Whether the better metaphor is that such a question elevates life or gives life depth, the experience of participating in mystery helps make lives more worth living, especially lives that seem mired in mundane suffering. They're more living because we are now participants in an exploration that is worth continuing. That sense of participating is what vulnerable reading is most about. As a conclusion, vulnerable reading is not narrative therapy, a professional practice that has quite specific parameters. But it does posit that narratives can intervene in lives and narratives can have a therapeutic effect. In any folk tale, perhaps the most basic opposition pits the forces of sterility and stasis, whether these operate by locking up the daughters, by hoarding treasure, or by interrupting the progress of the seasons, against the forces of fecundity, of change, and of life itself, usually represented by marriage, the main topos of fecundity and change. The risk of illness, the genuine, deep risk of illness, is that it can impose a winter of the soul. In a recent illness narrative told on a website, a young woman whose cancer had just recurred wrote that the worst part was going back into what she called the bloody waiting game. That including both being ill and conditions of treatment with its imposed waiting. 
That bloody waiting game endangers our humanity as much as disease endangers our physical lives. For me, the most generalized goal of the health humanities is to keep life moving and vital, even if life, to be honest, is running out. Crucially, that vitalizing movement must be shared between patients and those who care for them. Neither group can drag along the dead weight of the other. Health humanities has to offer something to everyone or it will scarcely be helpful to anyone. The Tempest ends with the promised marriage of Miranda and Ferdinand. The exiled lives are being reintegrated. The kingdoms of Milan and Naples are being joined. The world is back in motion. We who leave the theater, or perhaps leave the reading group, can feel our own lives have been reanimated. Shakespeare has a fine metaphor for that reanimation, although it goes by quickly in dialogues that when you first hear it seems only to show how utterly annoying the characters of Antonio and his would-be usurper friend Sebastian can be. Antonio and Sebastian are making fun of Gonzalo's utopian reverie. And Sebastian says, I think he will carry this island home in his pocket and give it to his son for an apple. To which Antonio replies, extending the apple metaphor, and sowing the kernels of it in the seas, bring forth more islands. Northrop Fry, who I never studied with, but used to have the great honor of passing by on the street, poses such an elegant law, gloss on these lines that it's my greatest pleasure to give him the last word in the goals of vulnerable reading. It is Shakespeare who gives us, as members of his audience, his island, as one would give a child an apple, but with the further hope that we will not stop eating the apple, but will use its seeds to create for ourselves new seas and even more enchanted islands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for showing us these uh, ways to read The Tempest uh, and other works um, uh, <clears throat> from a vantage point of vulnerability. Um, I think you'll be vulnerable to some questions, uh, comments. If there are any from the audience, please let me know. I'll bring you the mic so that you can be heard. Yeah. That is, he's going to take you the mic so you can be heard. Thanks so much for that. Um, I love this. I love the phrase "vulnerable, uh, vulnerable reading," um, and I'm gonna uh, use it a lot. Um, but um, it's so interesting. Paula Vogel writes about um, polar opposites within characters, and that being what makes them interesting and mm. truthful. And you know, Auguste Boal talks about the many wills, the many desires of one character, and it's you, we really see that in Caliban, and obviously in many of Shakespeare's characters. But I wonder if, in your discussions in these, you know, in this Hamlet in the hospital experience, if you explore those polar opposites within one character, and if people explore that within themselves as well. Well, yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to get to. And that's why Shakespeare's characters are, 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 are so wonderful to work with um, because they, they have this kind of immediate familiarity and yet infinite, you, you can just go on and on with them. And, um, and so they're, they're, they're great to, to think with and to, to perpetually reimagine and reimagine oneself. There are few of Shakespeare's characters who, who really seem to be pretty unabashedly evil. 
Um, it's it's hard to find two sides to Iago. You have you have to really kind of strain the the text. Although maybe if you you know you you maybe, maybe can. Um, but but in Shakespeare, virtually everybody everybody has a, a story. Everybody's got a rationale, uh, even when they're they're acting really pretty badly. Um, and and I think that's one of the things that makes it most valuable because. To, to put it in, in Jungian terms, which I think are, are actually quite useful in at least this particular context, um, he allows us to explore our shadow sides. And, and that's, that's something that, that needs to, to take place in these groups. Um, both, both explore the, the darker sides of, of ourselves and the way we've acted, and also to, to, to give full credit to people who we might initially think had acted badly toward us, and, and explore what was going on for them that, that lends a, a plausibility to their action. Um, the phrase, I've, I, I didn't work into this lecture, but I used it a lot in my, my book, Letting Stories Breathe, is, is people who are struggling to hold their own. Um, everybody in Shakespeare is struggling to hold his or her own. And, and, and they're, they're often struggling against other people uh, who are making it more difficult for them to hold their own, but they're all struggling to hold their own. And, and if everybody in a place like a hospital could remember that everybody else is struggling to hold their own and really foreground that recognition as they deal with those other people, <laughs> things would go along a lot better. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought it was very powerful. Um, I was disappointed by two things. One was that you, you weren't, I would love to be a fly on the wall of one of these groups. Um, and then, um, and so it would be nice to know what the experience is and how people understand the experience of going through the groups. And then the other point of disappointment was that, that you didn't seem, you seem very reluctant to bring the patients in. So I was curious about what that reluctance was, because you said you're just doing it with providers at the moment. So, oh, so, to so bring I them into the groups. Bring them into the groups, right. So I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering why you're depriving them of that experience. Well, you know, um, in terms of, of your, your first disappointment, um, I, I, I want to hold on. I want to sustain that disappointment. I want to make, make you really a lot more disappointed. I, I want to disappoint you so much that, that you'll start your own group. And, and then you'll get in touch with me and we'll exchange messages about your experiences starting your group. And, and then other people will start their groups and pretty soon we'll have a network. And so that's, that's, a, that's a disappointment. Oh, I'm gonna make a very strained metaphor here. The, the flames of which I hope to fan. Um, so I, I'm very happy that I disappointed you in, in, in that response. And, and, and when you do start your own group, um, I think it's really important, as I said, that the, that the groups, that, that you're able to participate in the groups without thinking about what did somebody just say that might be writable material. That'll, that'll free you just to be another participant in the group by not writing directly about it. Although I do keep notes, I do try to learn from the groups. You know, it, it's, 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 it has its own structure as a process. Um, it's, it's not just we're not just making this up as we go along, although we're constantly changing it as we go along. In terms of your, your second disappointment, you know, honestly, it's, it's just been a matter of, of time and recruitment and getting the right people. And the people I imagine are, are people who are in, in fairly stable remission, whatever that means for their respective illness, um, but, but who, who still have some significant issues post-treatment to deal with or, or anticipating other illness episodes in the future, but, but who right now are in, are in stable condition. This is not a group for newly diagnosed people. This is not a group for people who are in any kind of intensive treatment. Um, that's one reason why I'm, I'm moved away from the support group kind of thing. Although I would love to run um, run groups in some of the, the standalone facilities that, that house support services for various illness groups. 
in, in, in Calgary and, and in other cities. Um, but honestly, that's, that's just a matter of, of not having had enough time yet. I was wondering about, well, first of all, thank you very much. That was really um, inspiring. But I was wondering about the text you use. So you, you're going to Shakespeare, which is the English language text that we always go to. But I mean, can we really say that this, aren't there other texts that might be sometimes easier for to get, first of all, the language is difficult and that might maybe speak more to a multicultural audience, males and females and so on. I mean, it just, well, I love Shakespeare as well, but I wonder, do we always have to go to Shakespeare? Is there no complicated character in any other works that might be actually easier accessible than Shakespeare is? You know, and, and one of my answers is, so start a group with another character, another author, and tell me about it. I mean, th absolutely, there's Shakespeare is in some ways an arbitrary choice, but not entirely an arbitrary choice. There are also several very good reasons for using Shakespeare. So if you want to do this with with a, with a different playwright, please do. One of the advantages of of using Shakespeare is that if you get people doing several groups in a row. Shakespeare reads in really interesting ways across plays. So to move from measure to measure, in which you also have a duke who is setting up a very elaborate theatrical for the people of Venice in that case, um, but and, and is therefore very much like Prospero, but, um, but, but unlike Prospero in that he doesn't have control over the action the way Prospero does, um, it, to move back and forth from measure to measure to the tempest and then back to measure for measure, that's a very enriching experience. As, as you begin to read characters across Shakespearean plays and talk about their variations. And so it's, it's good to have a playwright, I'll put it another way, there are very few other playwrights I know who create a, a a body of plays in which the characters read from one play to the other in such su suggestive ways. A second advantage of Shakespeare is the sheer difficulty of reading the language aloud because in a group, once people have, have exposed themselves in reading Shakespeare aloud, virtually anything else that they might open their mouths and say is easily said. <laughs> It's just so easy to talk, and it, it, so to speak, breaks the ice so very well. Um, a third advantage of Shakespeare is that his, his plays are just so readily available, and um, video versions of his plays are so readily available. And it's one of the things that, that I, I learned in, in doing the plays is that it's really good as a group to watch a DVD of the play before we start reading it. And, and if members of the group have seen several different performances, it's really interesting to talk about uh, performance decisions that different directors made. Um, so those are all some of the reasons for, for, for using Shakespeare, but, um, but absolutely, if, if, if you can find another playwright and run your groups using him or her, I'd love to know about it. <laughs> Greek and Roman literature, I, I have to say I find Shakespeare a bit too contemporary, but. <laughs> Hi, I'm, um, I, I feel like I have a one leg in two different worlds, so I'm a licensed clinical counselor, but I also have been wanting to start up some community groups that are not necessarily called therapy groups. Mm -hmm. So when you were talking about um, it not being bibliotherapy or narrative therapy, um, and I'm aware of you know, some of the parameters around narrative therapy, I guess one of my questions is, if you're starting a group in the community, is there a suggestion of a resource um, that's, that's maybe a template or a handout of certain like ground rules, group rules, things that that you tend to set in motion kind of as a, this is what to expect, but it's not therapy kind of thing um, that 
how, how do you, what's my question? Is there a resource or a handout or something that you give everyone at the beginning that sort of lays out the parameters? Um, That's again one advantage of, 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 of having just professionals in it. I, I think what you're talking about is, is probably really ethically necessary as you move toward um, non-professional participants. Um, with professionals, the contract was, this is an experiment and we're all agreeing to experiment on ourselves and we're really trying to figure that out as we go along. And, and I think it's, it's really only now that I could imagine um, creating such a document. Although, to tell you the truth, I'd really rather not because it, it raises all of the kind of trigger warning controversies. Um, there, there are very good reasons for it, and there are also a number of problems with it. Um, I mean, it's the general problem of, of um, disclosure and consent forms. You can never really specify everything that, that may be a problem, and you may raise problems that may not be problems. Um, and, and including, even if you deny that it's a therapy group, by, by having a formalized denial, you've kind of said that it sort of is. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a murky business. I would rather just tell people, we're all people who come together because we, we, we enjoy reading Shakespeare. It's fun. I want to credit Marty Cohen, who first of all taught me how much fun it is to, to read, read Shakespeare in this kind of reader's theater thing. Um, that's what I meant about having to thank half the room. Um, you know, we're just people who, who, who like to do this. Um, and and who who they also want to talk about issues from from either side of the healthcare divide, and um, and and again, you know when you when you get professionals into this kind of group, they also talk about their experience being patients. Um, so it's it's where in terms of of the second disappointment of the the person who asked the first question, you know, I, I actually do have patients already, they just also happen to be healthcare providers. Because, in fact, the two groups, you know, blur all the time in all kinds of ways. And, and you just don't know what somebody's going to go off on about their lives. Childhood memories, all kinds of things. Um, but I, I, I hope that this might might be useful to you in, in finding the kind of community group that you're, you're interested in. And it's, it's why I would, I'd, I'd like to, to get these things available in print sooner than later, <laughs> especially before I die. That's, you know, really my sooner criterion. Yeah. Before Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and uh, we, we, we don't, uh, we have to drive home. You see, there we were in residence, so we, the beer wasn't a problem. Um, we have to drive home, and it's often in the wintertime in Calgary, so you kind of have to take it easy on the beer, you know, but, <laughs> but that's the spirit of it. On that note, uh, perhaps there will be an opportunity that you all can find for yourselves to get a little beer and maybe a little leer, but in the meantime, please uh, do join me in thanking Arthur Frank for a great lecture. Thank you all.